told Sharon Rogers. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our program today, presented by Dr. Ronald C. White about President Lincoln. He's probably one of the most famous presidents and the most favorite president of many of you that are attending today. And I know you're going to be in for a real treat um, to learn more about Lincoln because um, Ron White is definitely a scholar on Lincoln and has presented numerous, numerous places about Lincoln. This is his fourth book, Lincoln in Private. We have it in the Pasadena Public Library that you can put it on hold and check it out. It's also available for purchase at Roman's Bookstore. So before we get going and I introduce um, Ron White, I want to tell you a little bit so that you can enjoy the program um, as wonderfully as possible. Um, today's program is going to be recorded and put on YouTube Pasadena Library that you are able to look at it after the program and share it with your friends and do it for research. Also, um, we have live transcript. You can see that written on the screen. You need to enable it yourself on your computer um, at the bottom. You can see where it says live transcript or the, C, the letter CC. Following the program and during the program, would you please put your questions into chat? And I will ask the questions of Dr. White so that um, we can have a nice discussion afterwards. And he says he will answer all of your questions. So you all know that the Pasadena Public Library, our central library has been closed due to seismic retrofit. And we have opened our other branches for longer hours. They're open until 7 p.m. at night. And I hope you take advantage of that. We're still doing curbside service and you may go into our libraries to um, select your books and check them out. Also, um, you know about the new mask requirement of wearing masks into all um, inside places. Um, we have lots of other additional programs throughout the summer. And if you go to the Pasadena Public Library website, our off the shelf for June and um, for July and August, you can find all of the programs and that's how you've signed up today. So I think we're ready to, we really are here today to hear from Dr. White. He is the New York Times best-selling author of four presidential biographies about Abraham Lincoln. A. Lincoln, a biography. He also wrote, um, let me read them all to you. Um, Lincoln in private, what his most personal reflections tell us about our greatest president. A Lincoln biography, the eloquent president, a portrait of Lincoln through his words and Lincoln's greatest speech the second inaugural. And in addition to lots of other books he's written, he wrote a book, American Ulysses, A Life of Ulysses S. Grant. His biography of Grant won the William Henry Seward Award for Excellence in Civil War Biography. White's essays and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Christian Science Monitor, and he has lectured at the White House and been interviewed on the PBS NewsHour. He has spoken on Lincoln in England, France, Germany, Italy, Mexico, and New Zealand. He attended Northwestern University and is a graduate of UCLA and Princeton Theological Seminary, earning a PhD from Princeton University. He's taught at UCLA, Whitworth University, Colorado College, and Princeton Theological Seminary. He is a reader at the Huntington Library here in San Marino and a senior fellow of the Trinity Forum in Washington, DC. He lives here in Pasadena with his wife, Symphony, Cynthia, excuse me. White's forthcoming books are the one I've just showed you, Lincoln in Private, what his most personal reflections tell us about our greatest president. And it was published on May 4th, 2021. And also Joshua 
Lawrence Chamberlain, a biography. And both of those books were published by Random House. So at this time, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. White. And welcome and thank you so much for your time and all of your efforts for us today at the Pasadena Public Library. Thank you, Christine, and thanks to the Pasadena Public Library for all the wonderful programs that you are giving to each of us. On July 1st, the latest Presidential Historian Survey was released just three weeks ago. We do this after the change of presidents, so there's been four of them done in the 21st century. They're done by C-SPAN. I've been privileged to participate in this one and the previous one. And once again, as in all four, Abraham Lincoln was ranked our greatest president. You might want to know who's two, three, four, five, six, seven. We can talk about that later. It was the spring of 1863, and Abraham Lincoln was facing a chorus of critics after two grueling years of the Civil War. While the Union and Confederate armed forces fought, the Northern public was becoming increasingly restless. In fact, they were beginning to call this Mr. Lincoln's War, because you may remember that people thought the North would win rather quickly. They had a much larger army, much greater industrial might, but now the war dragged on. And then, as now, there were protests in the streets, protests against Lincoln. One of them took place in Albany, New York. It was led by a man named Clement Van Landingham. He was a copperhead. These were what we would call peace Democrats. They wanted the war to end now and return the nation, as they said, as it was with slavery. So they sent the resolves to Lincoln, and Lincoln, in his habit, would reply to these petitions, these protests, in a public letter written for a newspaper. As he began to write this letter, a congressman, a young congressman, James F. Wilson of Iowa, entered his office. He watched Lincoln writing, and he said, oh, this is absolutely marvelous. You can sit down and write such a profound letter from scratch? Lincoln demurred. He said, no, it's all there and he pointed to an open desk drawer. It was in disconnected thoughts, which I had jotted down from time to time on separate scraps of paper. The president then explained that he saved my best thoughts on the subject. He told Congressman Wilson, I never let one of those ideas escape me. Well, Lincoln did not want his best thought to escape him, but over the years, they've escaped us. Why? because they're spread out over multi-volume collections of Lincoln's words, his speeches, his letters. What my book attempts to do is to bring into focus what I call the private Lincoln behind the public Lincoln. What do I mean? Lincoln wrote notes to himself. He never dated them. He never titled them. He never signed them. It's like you might write a note to yourself. He never expected anyone to ever see them. After his assassination, his untimely death, his young secretaries, John Nicolay and John Hay, gathered together all of his papers. As the years went by, they would finally write a 10-volume biography of their boss, Abraham Lincoln, and ultimately publish another multi-volume collection of his papers. In these papers, they found these notes. I went to the Abraham Lincoln Papers Project that is a new one in Springfield, Illinois, and I said, well, how many of these notes do we have? They said, well, we believe we have 111 that have survived. I'm confident that Lincoln wrote hundreds and hundreds more, just like you and I might write notes to ourselves and then not contain them. We have 111, and for the first time ever, all 111 are published in this book, so you can see them all. Only one is from the 1830s, six are from the 1840s. Let's refresh our memories. Lincoln was born in 1809 in Kentucky. He moved in 1816 with his parents to Indiana. In 1830, the family moved to Illinois. In 1831, he separated from his parents as a young man and took up residence in New Salem. Well, in New Salem, he would sleep in the back storeroom of a grocery store 
or he might board with a family for three or four weeks, not exactly conducive to keep his notes. So that's why I think that only one from the 1830s, six from the 1840s survived. Many of them are from the 1850s and then in his presidency in the 1860s. So I had quite a decision to make of the 111 notes, which ones would I choose to focus on? But what I wanted to do was to show the wide range of Lincoln's thinking and writing. Let's remember Lincoln had only one year of formal education. Boys who worked with their fathers on farms in, in Kentucky and Indiana were only afforded the opportunity for school in January and February when it was too cold to work on farms and families would hire itinerant teachers who would come through the neighborhood and teach the children. So we think Lincoln had maybe five, possibly six, January and February's. That's all he had of formal education. And yet I find it amazing, and if you choose to read this book, I think you will find it amazing, of the incredible insight, wisdom, knowledge, writing ability. So I wanted to showcase the variety of Lincoln's writing. For example, the first one I include is a visit that Lincoln took to Niagara Falls in 1848. He had been campaigning in New England for the then Whig candidate for the presidency. And on his way home, he did what many people in that day did. He stopped at Niagara Falls before Yellowstone and before Yosemite. Niagara Falls was the great public treasure of America. And America was pretty self-conscious about its lack of cultural literary traditions, but what it thought it had over Europe and England was it had its natural beauty, and Niagara Falls was that natural beauty. So after his visit there, Lincoln writes this amazing note. I call it the lyrical Lincoln. This is a Lincoln that we don't often encounter. It's not a Lincoln that we see in his usual public writings. Let me just read the first part of it. I think it's just quite remarkable. Niagara Falls, by what mysterious power is it that millions and millions are drawn from all parts of the world to gaze upon Niagara Falls? He goes on to say, almost as a geologist, and then a philosopher, and then a historian, and towards the end, these are his words of this two-page note. But still there is more. It calls up the indefinite past when Columbus first sought this continent, when Christ suffered on the cross, when Moses led Israel through the Red Sea, nay, even when Adam first came from the hand of his maker, then as now Niagara was roaring here, the eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as ours do now. Contemporary with a whole race of men and older than the first men, Niagara is strong and fresh today as 10,000 years ago. The mammoth and the mastodon, now so long dead that fragments of their monstrous bones alone testify that they ever lived, have gazed on Niagara. In that long, long time, never still for a single moment, never dried, never froze, never slept, never rested. But the note ends with a comma. I think Lincoln was pulled away, as we might be, to some other responsibility, and he doesn't complete it. What I really find fascinating is I'm suggesting to you that this is a different Lincoln than we ordinarily describe. Well, Lincoln returned on his visit to Springfield. His law partner, William Herndon, after Lincoln's death, would picture himself as the person best positioned to define who Lincoln really was. Well, it turns out that Herndon himself had been to Niagara not many months before. And so when Lincoln comes home, he asks him, well, what did you experience there? And this is what Herndon wrote of his best friend, Abraham Lincoln. He had no eye for the magnificence and grandeur of the scene, for the rapids, the mist, the angry waters, and the roar of the whirlpool. Lincoln, according to Herndon, was, quote, heedless of beauty or awe. Herndon got it completely wrong. He didn't get Lincoln at all. 
you and I just heard Lincoln write this incredible fragment. Fragment because it's fragmentary, where Lincoln is in awe of the beauty of Niagara. Well, Lincoln runs four terms in the Illinois State Legislature, one term in Congress. He takes a very unpopular stand against the war with Mexico, criticizing President James Polk, demanding that Polk tell him the spot on which the Mexicans supposedly invaded America, because Lincoln is very convinced that's the other way around, the Americans invaded Mexico. So for the next five years, 1849 to 1854, Lincoln practices law. And the way one became a lawyer in those days was you were, you studied at a law office, you became a clerk to a lawyer. But Lincoln couldn't let that happen because he liked to travel what was called the Eighth Judicial Circuit, an area in central Illinois as large, larger really than the state of Connecticut. And he would be out on that circuit 180 to 200 days a year in small towns and hamlets. So I think he thought to himself, I can't entertain all these lawyers in my office in Springfield. Ah, I'll give a lecture for lawyers. Well, there's no evidence that he ever gave the lecture, but we have the notes of his lecture for lawyers. Let me read just a few sentences from it. He begins, I am not an accomplished lawyer. What Lincoln was by then in the early 1850s, one of the most accomplished lawyers in the state of Illinois. Can you imagine a modern politician, lawyer, CEO, president of a college starting out by saying, I am not? Oh no, we have a bunch of braggadocios in our culture today. I find quite as much material for a lecture, he says, in those points where I have failed as in those where I have been moderately successful. Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote a great book a few years ago on leadership in which she talks about uh, Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and Lyndon Baines Johnson. And she argues, and I agree with her, that every one of us fails. The question is whether we will admit our failures and whether we will learn from them. One more part of this brief notes for a law lecture discourage litigation, persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can, point out to them how the nominal winner is often the real loser in fees, expenses, and waste of time. As a peacemaker, the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man. There will still be business enough. You know, Lincoln was a great war president. He managed the Civil War. He actually checked books out of the Library of Congress to teach himself to be commander in chief. But I think he thought he'd be a better peace president. Sadly, he was assassinated 41 days into his second term. Listen to that sentence again. As a peacemaker, a lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man. Lincoln's goal as a lawyer was not to bring all his clients to court, but to persuade them to get along with each other. Why? Because he understood the meaning of community and going to court would be just one major way of destroying that community. Well, in 1854, Lincoln basically leaves his law practice. Why? Because the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed in the United States Senate. What was this act? It was an act that would allow the possibility of voting for slavery in the new territories. Kansas and Nebraska, much larger than in the states today of Kansas and Nebraska. Lincoln said, you mean you can vote on the morality of slavery? Stephen Douglas, who superintended the bill through the Senate, called his promise of what he called popular sovereignty, that this is a democracy, that you ought to be able to vote on slavery. Lincoln thought a long, long time about how to deal with slavery. Actually, when he got ready to speak, I'm not sure how he would do in our 24-7 news cycle, he took his time before he finally spoke on this vexing issue of slavery. Remember I said 111 documents exist. Well, 110 are in Springfield. One is in Dallas, Texas. 
and the White House Historical Association in August for the every four years they leave Washington, they're going to Texas to visit the George H.W. Bush Library, the George W. Bush Library, the Lyndon Baines Johnson Library, and the home of the person who owns this next fragment. And I'm going to have the privilege of speaking to that fragment in Harlan Crow's home in Dallas, Texas. Listen to what Lincoln talks about in this fragment on slavery. It's not titled, it's not dated, it's not signed. We can tell it's Lincoln by his distinctive handwriting. Let's put it up on the screen now, Shona, if we can, so that everyone can see this fragment. I think you'll see that you can read Lincoln's handwriting pretty easily. People practiced cursive writing in that day. So I'm going to read it, but I think you can read it for yourself. If A can prove, however conclusively, that he may of right enslave B, why may not B snatch the same argument and prove equally that he may enslave A? Oh, you say A is white and B is black. It is color then, the lighter having the right to enslave the darker. Take care. By this rule, you are to be a slave to the first man you meet with a fairer skin than your own. Thank you for enlarging that even easier to see. Oh, you do not mean color exactly. You mean whites are intellectually the superiors to blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them. Take care again. By this rule, you are to be a slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. But say you, it is a question of interest. And if you can make it your interest, you have the right to enslave another very well. And if he can make it his interest, he has the right to enslave you. Mr. Crow and his full-time curator have told me that of all the documents they possess, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, on and on and on, for them, this is the most valuable document of all. Do you sense the way Lincoln is attacking this problem? It's really like he's a courtroom lawyer. He's marching up and down saying, oh, it's the skin color. Oh, it's the intellect. Oh, it's the interest. Do you see Lincoln's nimble mind as he talks about this vexing issue of slavery? Well, I promised at the beginning that one thing I'm hoping to do in this book is to show the private Lincoln behind the public Lincoln. Lincoln grew up in what was called the Second Great Awakening. This was a religious revival, strong in Kentucky and Indiana, in which his parents participated. They attended Baptist churches in both Kentucky and Indiana. It was a very emotional kind of religion and Lincoln, as a boy, did not like the emotion. He would come out of church on a Sunday morning, get up on a stump, and say the minister's sermon word for word until his father hit him on the backside and told him to get on home. Well, then Lincoln did what some of us have done or our children or our grandchildren have done. He rejected the faith of his parents. In New Salem, he wrote a paper criticizing the Bible and what he called revealed religion. We have from many witnesses in New Salem that someone ripped it out of his hand and threw it into the fire. Not a very smart thing for an aspiring politician to be attacking Orthodox Christianity. But life then tumbles in and Lincoln begins to rethink his faith. We're going to come to that in just a minute. But after he re-enters the political wars in 1854, he decides to run for the Senate. In those days, before the 20th century, the senators were elected by state legislatures. And Lincoln runs in the winter of 1855, and he leads on the first seven ballots. But then he begins to understand that he cannot win. His friends and supporters want him to stay in the race. He said, no, if I stay in the race, I might lose to someone who's for slavery. So I will back out and allow a Democrat to win the race because he's against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. After his defeat, Lincoln was very magnanimous in public. He said, it's okay, I'm, I'm all right. I'll get by, don't feel badly for me. 
but privately, he said something quite differently. I brought up the Second Great Awakening because Lincoln, in his public remarks, never really wanted to express his feelings about anything. He would only express his thinking. But in this private note, let me read to you what it says. 22 years ago, now we can date it, Stephen Douglas and I first became acquainted. We think this was written in 1856. We were both young then, he a trifle younger than I. Even then we were both ambitious. I perhaps quite as much so as he. With me, the race of ambition has been a failure, a flat failure. With him, it has been one of splendid success. In public, Lincoln never said this. With me, the race of ambition has been a failure a flat failure, he speaks his own deep feelings. In less than four years, Lincoln will be elected president of the United States. Two more fragments. When Lincoln returned from that time in Congress, and I think this is a lesson for us today, his law partner Herndon was very much an anti-slavery person. So he said to Lincoln, let's Let's subscribe to some of the national anti-slavery newspapers and magazines. And Lincoln agreed. But then he said to Herndon, he said, I think we also should subscribe to some Southern newspapers, the leading newspaper in Richmond, Virginia, and the Courier, the leading newspaper in Charleston, South Carolina. And Herndon said, well, why in the world would we do that? And Lincoln said, because we need both sides at the table both sides at the table. In the 19th century, people in big cities would have a Republican newspaper and a Democratic newspaper. In Chicago, the Republican newspaper was the Tribune. The Democratic newspaper was the Times. But people then read both. Do you and I read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal? I wonder, or are we stuck in our own silo on one side or the other? Well, Lincoln carried out this whole understanding of wanting to have both sides at the table because in the middle of his debates with Stephen Douglas, took place in 1858, unknown to anyone at that time, Lincoln was reading a remarkable book. It was a book about pro-slavery theology. Why would he do such a thing? Because he wanted both sides at the table. The book was written by Dr. Ross, a Presbyterian minister in Huntsville, Alabama. The book was so popular, it was reviewed in London, England. And so Lincoln read this book. He never uses the book in any of his public debates or speeches. But this is a little of a fragment that he writes after reading Dr. Ross's book, Slavery Ordained by God, is the title of the book. Suppose it is true that the Negro is inferior to the white in the gifts of nature. Is it not the exact reverse justice that the white should for that reason take from the Negro any part of the little which has been given him? Give to him that is needy is the Christian rule of charity, but take from him that is needy is the rule of slavery. In my writing on Lincoln, I discovered after my first book, actually, but Lincoln often wrote by saying the words out loud before he put them to the paper. I knew that Lincoln, as people in the 19th century did, he always read out loud. He never read silently. He read out loud because he said this gave him two senses, the sense of the eye, for sure, but also the sense of the ear. In this fragment, I can hear Lincoln's emotion growing. Listen to the last two paragraphs. But slavery is good for some people triple exclamation point. As a good thing, slavery is strikingly peculiar in this, that is the only good thing which no man ever seeks the good of for himself. Nonsense, exclamation point. Wolves devouring lambs, not because it is good for their own greedy maws, but because it is good for the lambs, triple exclamation point. Lincoln is outraged by pro-slavery theology. Let's conclude with one more that you were able to see, Shauna, if we will put up the meditation on the divine will, what I'm calling here the theological Lincoln. 
My first book on Lincoln is, is treatment of the second inaugural address struck me when I began to teach Lincoln at UCLA. And in this short second inaugural, it's only 701 words, it would take about six and a half minutes to deliver. To my surprise then, I was new to the whole subject, Lincoln mentions God 14 times. He quotes the Bible four times. He invokes prayer three times. This surprised Lincoln's audience. Through the years, there's been quite a debate about Lincoln's religion. He never joined the church. It needs to be said that he was not a joiner. He spoke at many temperance association meetings. He was himself not a drinker, but he never joined a temperance society. So where in the world did this second inaugural address come from? Well, no one in the audience that day, March 4, 1865, knew, but now you and I know because Lincoln wrote something two and a half years previously that I think is the foundation of the address. At the end of August, 1862, the North suffered yet again a terrible defeat called the Second Battle of Bull Run or the Second Battle of Manassas. Lincoln convened an emergency cabinet meeting. Fortunately for us, three members of his cabinet kept diaries. One of them, Attorney General Bates, wrote in his diary, Lincoln told us he was fraught with the bitterest of anguish that he almost felt like hanging himself because of this one more Northern defeat. We think, remember it's not dated, he sat down that afternoon and wrote this brief memo. If you looked at it today, as I was privileged to do, it's now at Brown University. It is now titled Meditation on the Divine Will. That's because his young secretary, John Hay, found it after Lincoln's death, titled it himself, a good title, Hay, a graduate of Brown University, the John Hay Library. That's why it's there. We can read it together. The will of God prevails. In great contests, each party claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be, look at how Lincoln underlines keywords. He does this in his public speeches, but he also does this in his private notes or fragments. Both may be, and one must be wrong. Do you hear the logical Lincoln in that sentence? I love this next sentence. God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. Here's the sentence. In the present civil war, it is quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party, and yet the human instrumentalities working just as they do are of the best adaptation to affect his purpose. Remember, politicians, ministers were coming to Lincoln to say, God is on our side, God is on our side, but Lincoln knew they were also coming to Jefferson Davis and saying, God is on our side, God is on our side. I'm almost ready to say this is probably true, that God wills this contest. Lincoln is now surmising that in addition to the soldiers, the generals, he is commander in chief, there's another active agent in this war, that God wills this contest and wills that it shall not end yet by his mere quiet power. Lincoln was tired of the noisy God of his youth by his mere quiet power on the minds of the now contestants, he could have either saved or destroyed the union without a human contest. And having begun, he could give the final victory to either side any day. What do you mean, Mr. President? You're not daring to say God could give the victory to the Confederates? You don't want to say that in public. And of course he didn't. He said it only in private and you and I get to read it. Yet the contest proceeds. In this 10th and final chapter, I actually line up the key words of the meditation on the divine will and the second inaugural address to suggest how you can see that one is the foundation of the other. No one in the audience that day knew Lincoln had ever written this, but I think it's the key to his ongoing faith journey that will become public in the second inaugural. Well, in conclusion, I really enjoy talking to high school students. I've had the privilege of talking to high school students from Massachusetts to Hawaii and all points in between. 
I spoke to Poly High School here in Pasadena to 11th graders who were studying American history. And I asked them after talking about these fragments, I said, how long do you think it took Lincoln to write these fragments? They said, three minutes, four minutes. I paused, maybe a wry smile on my face. And I said, how about an hour or two or three? And I'll tell you, the faculty in the back of the room were all applauding. I said, you can't do this quickly. And you can't do this if you're distracted by your screens. Lincoln took his time to have this kind of profound thinking. So Lincoln's a 19th century person. I'm a little tired of wanting to take his name off of public schools and taking down monuments. He can't help us with climate change. He can't tell a president what to do in Afghanistan. But somehow the values that he embodies, truthfulness, humility, compassion, are values that we can partake of today. That's why he is again and again and again our greatest president. I know many of you, many of you know a lot about the public Lincoln. The Lincoln of the second inaugural that Gettysburg addressed, the Lincoln of the Emancipation Proclamation. This book, I hope, will allow you to see a different side of Lincoln, a private Lincoln, a Lincoln that we still need to get to know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ron. What a very, very interesting lecture. We all learned so much more about Lincoln. I thought it was interesting about how the students asked how long it took him to write. He was <laughs> a very thoughtful thinker. And we really, when you realize his lack or the little amount of formal education he had and how he really taught himself the power of books, absolutely amazing what mind he had and how he could think things through. Um, so someone wants to know what was the interest or what got you um, spurred your deep interest and longstanding love of Lincoln? Thank you for that question. Some of you will remember that in 1993, the Huntington Library put on its wonderful exhibit on Abraham Lincoln, the largest exhibit ever mounted in the United States at that time. They brought many things from Springfield and from uh, Louise Taper, a resident of Southern California, the largest private collector. I was teaching in the history department at UCLA, and I had the choice each year to offer a seminar of my own choosing. So I didn't know much about Lincoln. I remembered late, later that I'd read Carl Sandburg's books on Lincoln when I was a teenager. I thought, well, what if I offer a seminar on Lincoln and bring the students to the exhibit? how to get students engaged. I'll find someone at the Huntington, it wouldn't be me, to give a lecture on Lincoln. Some of you will remember the wonderful Paul Zoll. He gave the lecture. So the Huntington exhibit was so popular that they had to extend it. So I offered a second and next year, another seminar on Lincoln. And then when that ended, I took the students out to the Sh Lincoln Shrine in Redlands and we did that too. Well, we all read Lincoln's words together and I was taken by the second inaugural. So I thought, well, the next time I offer this seminar, I'll find a book on the second novel. At that time, there were five books on the Gettysburg Address. There was not one book on the second novel. I'd be sort of being foolish by saying, I'll write it. But one thing led to another, and I did end up writing that book. And that began my journey with Lincoln. My wife knows, Cynthia, that I sometimes am awake at 3 o'clock in the morning thinking about Abraham Lincoln. He is just the most compelling person. Well, well, you certainly found your calling and looking for those students. I can <laughs> remember going to that exhibit at the Huntington and it was absolutely fascinating. And Louise Taper um, had a fabulous collection. Do you collect yes. Lincoln artifacts? Do you have any? Oh, or I have, I've, I've, got a, I've got a Brady photograph, but I guess I haven't, got, be, haven't become a collector. It's a it's a big deal. It's an expensive deal. I'm grateful for those that do, but my collecting is, is documents and trying to write about them. <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, if Lincoln had been elected president in 1880, 
instead of in 1860. What kind of president do you think he would have been? That's a marvelous question. I've never been asked that question before. Any of us, all, all of us who know American history know that the post-Civil War America was a very different America, the beginning of industrialization, the increase of immigration, certainly urbanization. Lincoln lived in a different economic culture, what he called the right to rise. But if you started at the bottom and you played by the rules, you could rise. But now America in what we might sometimes call the Gilded Age faced a whole lot of different problems. And we began to struggle as we moved through the end of the 19th century. The glory of the Civil War was in the past. Reconstruction sadly did not bring people together. It actually drove them apart. And Ulysses S. Grant from 1868 to 1876 had tried to carry on, and I think he did the best he could, Lincoln's heritage. But it would have been a very different set of challenges if Lincoln was elected in 1880. Okay, thank you so much for that. So um, Lincoln wrote all these notes. Well, what kind of paper did he write them on? Um, notepads were expensive. Larger sheets were expensive. What did he use? Well, thank you, that's a good question. I'm so privileged to be published by Random House. If you choose to purchase the book or look at the book, you will see that they made the decision to print in color, in color. 16 pages of the notes so that you can see there it's all different kinds of paper. For example, this meditation on the divine will, it's kind of hard to see, but it, it's actually blue lined paper. Some of the, the papers of differing colors and sort of splotches on it. So it's really scraps. I mean, Lincoln actually called his notes scraps. I'm keeping my scraps. So it wasn't a, an organized notepad of any kind you will see that the different notes are often very different kinds of background. Oh, so, so it's fascinating your book because you actually, you start off as you talked about, you go to his first part as a lawyer, then as a politician, and then as a president. So you give a lot of thought and um, interesting that we can all read that. And there are, as you, I have the book and you can see all of these pages that Dr. White just talked about um, of all of the notes and you can see, see the difference in all of them. It's quite fascinating. And his penmanship was really very easy to read compared to some original manuscripts. So how would he have, would he have been taught how to write when the yes, teacher, in the teacher came? Century, in the 19th century, I'm now writing a biography of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the hero of Little Round Top at Gettysburg. And I discovered at Bowdoin College, where he was a student, they had what were called copy books, not blue books that we, some might remember where you're writing exam questions, but copy books were where you practiced your penmanship. So Lincoln's penmanship was very, very easy to read because he practiced it, as did others. And what I think we used to do a long time ago, this whole debate about should we be teaching cursive writing? I was recently before the pandemic at the National Archives in Washington and one of the curators said he was just astounded. That there were college students who arrived. They could not read the cursive writing that was so clear and legible from the 19th century because they had never learned cursive writing themselves. Well, well, we should all go back to that for sure. That would make us all easier because we don't write letters, um, you know, and stationary mail them to people like you used to do as much. So you all send all this email and perhaps our spelling isn't as right as correct right. either because we depend upon spell check, all, right. these, all these different things. So Someone asked, says that it's interesting that Lincoln's changes his attitudes about slavery over the years. Yes, that's a, that's, a, that's a great comment, he does. Lincoln did not begin the Civil War to free the slaves. He began the Civil War to save the Union. He did not think the Constitution gave him the right to deal with slavery where it was. I think for all of us, 
often it's, it's our experiences that may be the key to the change of our thinking. He did, as a very young man, take a, a load of cargo down the Mississippi River at age 19 to New Orleans. And when he was there, he was astounded and aghast that on one side were male slaves, on the other side were female slaves. Marriage was not recognized in slavery. And he understood that these men and women would be sent in different places and their marriage would be gone. So I like to tell the story because today there's a huge debate. Oh, Lincoln only did the Emancipation Proclamation as a political or a military measure. Well, after the proclamation, the Union Army a few months later began to recruit African-Americans to the army and 90% of them came from the South. So the governor of Kentucky, Thomas Bramlett, was, became very upset with Lincoln. He wrote him three letters telling him, you are depopulating the African-American population, which we need to tend the crops in Kentucky. Not satisfied, he went to, to he made an appointment and traveled to Washington, D.C. And on a Saturday morning, Lincoln met with Bramlett, a former United States Senator from Kentucky, and the editor of a leading newspaper. And this is what Lincoln said spontaneously. I am naturally anti-slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. Remember I said Lincoln doesn't use that word feel very often, feeling, but he does here. These were not three men from Massachusetts. These were three men from Kentucky. But one more word about this. Lincoln, the politician, had to ask himself the question, what, when will I free the slaves? He worried that if he freed the slaves too soon, he would lose the four border states and therefore lose the war. So one day, Charles Sumner, anti-slavery senator from Massachusetts, was with Lincoln and pretty critical of Lincoln for not freeing the slaves now. And Lincoln turned to Sumner and he said, Sumner, you and I have exactly the same idea, but we're operating on a different clock, a different clock. I think a central question is always, what time is it? And Lincoln answered the question, what time is it, at exactly the right time to free the slaves. Well, what insights into Lincoln's character did you access from his scraps that we may not know? Thank you. That's a wonderful question, too. Uh, I, several have already been enunciated. First of all, Lincoln's willingness to admit his own failure, to learn from his failure. It's very easy, and I have to stop myself from falling into the trap of thinking this person is just a superhero, never makes a mistake. That's not true at all. Another quality that comes through is his willingness to look at the other side, to read the Southern newspapers, to read a pro-slavery book. He, I thought, well, maybe he will bring this into his public speeches or perhaps his debates with Stephen Douglas. He really doesn't do that. But behind these debates and behind these public speeches, Lincoln is reading this material with which he doesn't agree. I recently spoke to weeks ago at a meeting in Rapid City, South Dakota of Midwestern state legislatures. They held it there because of Mount Rushmore, which is quite a remarkable thing to see. And so when you see Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Teddy Roosevelt, I asked the audience then what unites them? Intellectual curiosity. They were all readers. Do you know that Teddy Roosevelt wrote 37 books? Lincoln's intellectual curiosity. I hope that is a quality that we look for in our political leaders. Lincoln embodied it, as did the other three. And I think the greatest of our presidents had that kind of intellectual curiosity. This is what shined through to me in all of these fragments. Well, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for all of your wonderful information and insights into Lincoln that we just really didn't know. Um, and I would um, encourage everyone to read your books. There's four of them. 
but you should read the most recent, Lincoln, in private. Um, so are there any other questions that anyone would like to ask? Um, I encourage you to get the book because um, the notes, the appendix, the index, it is thoroughly in researched, as you can tell by Dr. Um, um, White's presentation, how wonderfully researched it is and um, the insight he gives into Lincoln. So are there any other questions? Will, will it be in an audio book? It is in an audio book. And I have to say to my great surprise when I the Lincoln biography and the Grant biography, I asked about doing those. Oh, no, no, no. These are done by professional actors. I discovered they're mostly British actors and the two men who did those two books were great. So one more time I said, would you consider me to be the narrator of this book? So they said, well, we'll listen to you on YouTube. And to my surprise, they said, yes, you will be the narrator of the audio. Now I had a director in my ear. We rented a studio in Pasadena. It took us four days. The director was a British actor who lives in Southern California. And he would say things like, that word was a little bit slurred. Would you say that word again? And so after we finished the whole project, they sent it to New York and New York discovered 75 different sentences that they thought were not completely clear. So they sent the thing back to me and I had to go back into the studio and say each of those 75 sentences over again, one by one by one by one by one. All 75. <laughs> 75, but in, they were all individual sentences. So I had a great time doing this. First, they were going to get someone. They said, well, you will read Lincoln and we'll, 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 you'll be the narrator and we'll get someone to read Lincoln. And I said, well, you know, I've been living with Lincoln now for about 25 years. I said, I think I know how Lincoln might say the, oh, oh, yes. Well, we'll let you be the narrator for the whole thing. So that's, <laughs> I was very pleased. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, very, very pleased. So it's a um, random house. Oh, yeah. Random house. Okay. Um, so what order should we read the books? Do we read them in the order that you publish them? If I'm we right. haven't read any books on Lincoln, what should we read? First? I suggest uh, with dipping into the smallest of the books first, Lincoln's Greatest Speech, the second inaugural. And then if that appetite, you like that bite-sized so morsel, then I might go to the biography, A. Lincoln. That's the wide angle look at Lincoln. The book, The Eloquent President, I take some of his major speeches, I believe he is our most eloquent president, and talk about how he became the most eloquent president and why he is. And then perhaps this book lasts because it goes from the public to the private Lincoln, but any order will do. <laughs> any order will do. Well, thank you very much. It's just um, just to get going and start, start reading. Um, so thank you so much for your, this fabulous presentation. Everybody in chat is saying thank you, thank you. They really enjoyed it. Um, absolutely fascinating and we all learned so much today. And I thank you so much for your time to share all of your vast knowledge with us. And I you, for the privilege of being you travel all over the country presenting about Lincoln. So thank you well, there's very much. a great much. interest not only in the United States, but what surprised me, Cynthia and I, just before the pandemic began, were in New Zealand. And our, the couple that traveled with us who were very knowledgeable about New Zealand, they were the ones who said, why don't you give four lectures in New Zealand? And we were just amazed at the knowledge of American history in New Zealand and the interest in Abraham Lincoln. So there's an interest in Lincoln around the world. Well, that's, that's fascinating. He was really considered one of our greatest presidents. So thank you very much for all of your energy and your time to write these wonderful, wonderful books. It was a fabulous program and we thank you very much. For those of you that attended that would like to listen to it again, please remember it will be on YouTube, Pasadena Library. Thanks to Dr. White agreeing for us to be able to do that. Uh, none of your photos will be shown or your names. So thank you very much. Let's give Dr. White a big round of applause. Thank you so much.
appreciate it. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.